Welcome to The Rich Report, a podcast with news and information on high-performance computing. Today, my guest is from Crossroad Systems. We have the EVP of the company, David Cerf. David, welcome to the show today. Thank you, Rich. I appreciate it. Great to, great to be here. Well, well, thanks for coming on. What I thought we'd do today is just go through your slides and then follow that with the Q&A. Excellent. I, we're a 17-year-old public company that provides data protection solutions. Um, we uh, actually have provided our products through lots of companies, you know, like uh, IBM and HP and others, and we also have Crossroads branded solutions. And what we're really focusing, focusing on for HPC is around uh, fixed content and uh, the constant growth of around um, unstructured data. And how do we all manage that? And what's that mean in the HPC world? The, the real change that's happened in the world is that data is no longer just uh, database fixed content. It's really become much more complex. It's changed the way that we all work and deal with our daily lives. Um, and it's really about having the right information available to when the user wants it, whether it's on our phone or whether it's in uh, uh, analytics. But it's really changing the way that we think about the problem, particularly uh, just from the fact that we're trying to keep everything available because it makes it a much richer experience, whether we're running more analytics because we have better data sets available, or as a user that we can get back to you know, all our bank records, not just the last 30 days. The real, the real change in the industry that, that's driving big data, and I use, I use a little d, little d in this case, and that is just lots of, lots of volume, is this con- change in, that we've seen in the industry that has gone from fixed content, unstructured data versus fixed content like database and very transactional stuff that we, we would see in, um, uh, in traditional enterprise. And the real growth in the market is coming around the fact of this, this file-based uh, world is really putting pressure on how we think about data management. The, 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 the changes for the customer and where it puts pressure on them is the way that they think about the budget. So we always have IT constraints, but this massive growth and prolific growth of data is uh, put a lot of pressure about being able to affordably keep it and then think about the idea of keeping it everything forever, potentially depending on the vertical that you're in. And so that, that really challenges the budget. The other part that comes into that is data protection. So we've always thought about the fact that we have content, we need to ensure we can get it back. <clears throat> Do we keep multiple copies through backups or something like that? The more data we have, again, the more complex the problem becomes. Um, also ensuring that we, we have a retention concept, you know, in, in whatever period that is for you as a business, is that seven years, 15 years? And the average archive for for enterprises, 10 to 15, but in high-performance computing, that could be significantly longer because those data sets might be something that you'll never capture again. So if we think of oil and gas, you may never get a chance to do a seismic project again in that part of the world. So forever is, is a reality for them. And we also have thought about archiving uh, historically, but the classic ar- archive approaches can be very complex. It can require lots of um, different types of applications that don't necessarily work well together and those have caused challenges. So these are all classic pain points that we see within the idea of keeping archival information available. And then the last problem that's a growing concern in multiple places around the world is the change in power. Now, power may not be a real issue if we're just talking about 30 or 50 terabytes. It could be to certain people, but we certainly talk about larger da- uh, data sets uh, that go into petabytes or greater, hundreds of petabytes, power certainly becomes a major part of the equation. So we're no longer looking at just CapEx and how we think about adding something into our environment around keeping the data, but we have to absolutely put into the OpEx and the total TCO. And in different parts of the world, power can mean different things. It can become a majority of the way we think of our infrastructure costs around our data center even, that when we look at all the components that go into supporting the power requirements uh, can consume a lot of our available dollars. So how do we look at solutions differently? And this is really where Crossroads comes in with our solution called Strongbox. And what we provide is something that is very simple to uh, use and manage because what we're using is uh, what we all know, a NAS file-based interface that is purpose-built to be able to manage archive data for long-term data protection. So we're integrating the ability to have a a way to manage our data cost-effectively and protect it in in a simple solution. So <clears throat> the way the Strongbox looks to the user is a closed system. And that is that we present what looks like a file, uh, file system, a, either a SIF, NSF mount point 
to the client, to the application. Users could drag and drop files into it. Applications can write directly to it. But what we're looking at in this, in, in this slide is that it's a closed system in the fact that it's all self-managed. And what we're taking advantage of in, in the solution is a combination of disk and tape to bring the best of both worlds. So unlike classic systems where we've had to manage disk by itself and then we strap on tape, this is a system that is fully closed and integrated to present the user a single manageable file system solution that then leverages the best of both worlds. That is the simplicity, ease of use, and speed of disk with the cost efficiency and the data protection that we gain from tape. And so if we want to think about how does, how does this work together, let's walk through how we write a file into the Strongbox. The files come in, they land in a Strongbox system, and we move everything to tape. We're not an HSM or an I, I, um, ILM type of solution where we're moving files up and down. Everything goes securely and is protected at the tape tier. What we're doing is we keep a placeholder that determines based on the user's performance and how they want to access their data to let them leverage disk cache for speed. Very much like we do in just a, a basic disk uh, hard drive that you have a little bit of SSD as a cache buffer that helps accelerate the speed and spindles. This is a closed system that lets the user define through policy the way they want to access their data and take advantage of these, this, this policy engine to control speed and performance to where their experience may never be, uh, they may never know that they're on tape at all. So files come in, they're written in the system, and everything moves down to the tape tier. Now when I want to go get my file back and I click open file, time to first byte is instant because we're doing some unique things in these policy engines that allow us to hand the file back to the user very quickly because we either keep all or part of the file also up in the cache. This is a user-defined setting, so they could either keep the whole file up in the cache or part of the file. So if I had the full file in the cache, it would come off like it would any other disk-based system, and the file retrieval is completed. But let's say it's a big file. Let's say it's a gigabyte file, and we've only kept part of the file in the cache. We're actually going to start feeding the file read back off of the disk while in parallel we'll spin up the tape and we'll, we'll start reading the, the, the file back off the tape um, in parallel to the system. So the user's experience is still seamless. He may never again know that he's coming off the tape because he's getting some of the file feed coming off the disk. And it's that balancing, that's a kind of our secret sauce, it's that balancing and managing that that allows a, a user's experience to be defined by the value of their data. So data becomes hot and cold. Let's say in HPC in particular, we've run something and we have a current data set. We may be hitting that very frequently. We might want more of that data in the cache to be able to have a faster user experience. But then when we're done with that project and it goes away and, it, and it's available, it can move off of the cache and then just stay in, only in the tape. And it can, come, it can move up and down based on policy, based on that user access. And we have lots of policies that can allow that user to define their environment and tune it very specifically to the way they want their data access. So let's just walk through what does a classic environment look like in the problem today? So everybody's got a bunch of different layers of the disk. It might be tier zero, tier one, tier two, et cetera. We have different vendors in those different tiers. Uh, next, click next again. We should now see it build out to where you see, of course, we want to protect that data. So we have either um, uh, HSM systems where we tier stuff off. Those could be SAMFS or HPFS, or in some cases, we're just backing that up. So what that it is when it's in a backup or HSM, it can be offline unavailable. The difference with Strongbox is all files are always online and accessible. So there's a really unique difference there. But in this, in, this, in this example here, we're looking at what is offline. Let's click it again. The problem is that as the data sets continue to grow, and we have to add more disk to support it. The complexity is compounded as well back to the data protection layer. And that becomes larger and more complex to manage as well. Let's hit next again. What Strongbox changes is a complete different view of that to where we keep a file base. So even though we have tape in here, it's not blocked. This is a complete file-based solution that is seamless. An application can move data directly to it or it can work in, uh, as a tier underneath your existing disk as a way to blend out your price per gigabyte and get more efficiency as just a cheaper file tier. So you could think of this in some ways as just a way to bring, you know, if you want to think of this quote-unquote cheaper disk or you know, a bottomless disk concept into your architecture to where it's accessible and available online like a disk-based system or file, excuse me, disk file-based system would be, but with the economics of tape. 
Now, what's important in this, this solution that's different than anything else on the market is it's completely non-proprietary. What we're writing on the tape is the actual file itself because we're using linear tape file system or LTFS, which is now standard in LTO5, LTO6, and the enterprise tape drives that come from IBM and Oracle. And what we're doing is we, we are not modifying or changing that file at all. We're writing that tape as it's written from the application. Now, LTFS tape can be read in any LTO drive. Uh, so if we took a tape box uh, and removed it out of a strong box environment, we could stick it in an HP quantum or IBM drive and read it back like a big USB key. So there's no vendor lock-in around your data. And that's important when we think of archive and long-term retention is your vendors may change over time. Things may change, but as long as you can read a SIF or NSF file, you're going to be able to get your data back with or without the, um, the Strongbox environment. Again, we're not adding agents into this environment. Um, no extra software layers. The Strongbox is deployed as an appliance. It's plug and play. Uh, eight clicks through it, and you're up writing files into the system immediately, and you have no more tape overhead management. The Strongbox manages all of that in the same way that we just add disk arrays behind, a, behind our, our controllers and et cetera, and we plug and play and add disk. You can plug and play and add a tape library into this. So those are really the simplicity that we bring to the equation, which has also been a challenge historically, is how do you manage these complex environments? In this case, you have a single point to manage as a file system, and the rest of it is, is very simple and closed to the user. Again, and this, this makes now tape a very open, easily usable solution because you're not locking the tape up to the application to read it. We can use tape like USB sticks to be able to access it in any way we want. Now, one of the things that's important to think about when we talk about long-term archive is the media itself. And some of the great changes we've seen from technology is that um, LTO6 and Enterprise Tape now use barium ferrite. And unlike older tape technologies that where the, 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 the oxides that were used on the, on the tape substrate could oxidize, and you could see things maybe go bad over time, Barium ferrite is incredibly stable, very dense, and um, can help ensure the, the value of your data can sit there and be maintained without any question. So you're talking about a, an incredible technology when combined into this simplicity of management. You now have a solution that really can address this pain problem, that is to ensure your data is protected, secure, and accessible long term. Now, next slide. On top of the technology of barium ferrite being really stable, Strongbox has built-in data protection as well, where it's verifying both at the file level and within the system at the tape level or the drive level to ensure the readability and recoverability of it. So we have things that protect the, and ensure data readability at both at the file by adding hash code and MD5 uh, uh, checks on every read and write on the file. We're verifying media. We're dry, verifying drives. We're just checking the constant health, and we have policies to take action to be able to ensure that you can recover that data. And you can write multiple copies. So you're not limited um, within the system. You can create multiple copies that stay with inside the system. You can use tape in the classic sense of exporting copies and moving them to second sites. And we even have built-in replication uh, through a Spera. Um, in this example, what we're showing is that we can have a primary site in New York and a secondary site in Hollywood, and where we can use it both replication and tape to be able to move data back and forth. So since we write the actual file to the tape, let's say we had 100 terabytes and we're our da primary data centers in New York and we want to move that to a secondary site, we could write two copies of tape in a strong box, export one copy, stick it in FedEx, and overnight it over to uh, Hollywood. When the tapes come in there and we have a second strong box system, we just have to insert the tape. Uh, strong box tapes are actually self-describing to, to another strong box where they recognize a policy. So the moment we insert those, we actually now have the ability to have both copies online without having to read the entire tape over again. So using t uh, tape for portability now is very, very simple. And now to be able to network through asynchronous replication, we have multiple ways to connect and move data. So in this example, we've moved our first copy to California. Now we have data online in New York, online in California. Let's say the primary copy in New York is unreadable. Strongbox is smart enough to know to call over the network to another location and bring those and retrieve those files back. So when they're connected, all those create a, um, a concept of, of, of DR where we can pull the file back either over the wire or over the tape even. 
So if we lost New York completely, if the whole data center went down, <clears throat> let's say we had another Sandy hits New York, wipes it out, and lost the data center, we could bring new hardware in, call, copy a tape back from Hollywood, bring those in and insert them a, into a new library, and we're back online. And without having to do complex recovery concepts, this is just reading a file, right? That's all we're doing, just like we would move things on USB keys, except for it has an intelligence layer to be able to connect that and manage it. So those are really kind of cool ways to manage large data sets that we want to be able to move and share. Now, at the end of the day, it's all about price per gigabyte. So it's important. Why would I buy something you know, over a disk-based solution? Again, the economics of tape are, are, are well-defined um, and, and documented. And this is a good example that we put together uh, with, with multiple of our partners and library manufacturers to help share some of that information. So we took an example of a one petabyte. And if it's archived data, we assume at least there's two copies. And we took an average time frame of about 10 years. The longer out you go, of course, the better the economics. And so mileage can vary based on size and the, of the example. But this gives you a fair example of what you're looking at as the total cost. This is both the capital and operating expense cost to run that petabyte archive for that period of time. So you're looking at a significant savings. In this case, we're talking um, almost $6 million over that 10-year window reduction uh, in cost. And so you can see there's a significant um, value to it. The bigger the archives get, a lot of the impact comes from the fact that we can keep file data online and accessible without using the power. And so we can see that you get a 95% reduction. So high-performance computing environments are typically pretty large. This becomes really important depending where uh, you, and how you manage your power. So let's hit the next slide. Let's talk about some examples so you can understand who's using this type of technology, where is it becoming, and, and, and how is it used. So in this case, we're going to talk about uh, JPL. Uh, they actually are using multiple Strongbox environments, um, in their, and when including for the uh, Mars Curiosity rover. Uh, so that data is now being securely protected in Strongbox environments. And um, if we click on the next one, next slide, what was their challenge? You know, this is important data. They may never get an opportunity to collect it again, so the concept of losing it is just unacceptable to the mission. Um, it also had to be cost-effective because um, as part of NASA, you know, there's a budget and there's a limit and they can't afford in, you know, indefinite uh, costs, so they had to be able to control that and ensure it. And we needed to have multi-copies, the ability to um, both scale and protect it in multi-copy. So these were, the, these were the requirements on it. What did, what did Strongbox provide for them? Well, most importantly, it provided a very simple existing in interface, file-based, that they could add to their environment with their existing applications and just start writing to it. They didn't have to do anything complex in setting up uh, big software packages and other things. They just added this and started writing files to it immediately. It also, because of the nature of the tape, they could, they could scale. So you can add big libraries that are very scalable into very large environments. Uh, strong boxes uh, scale up into over 35 ter uh, petabytes um, in, in one single device. So you can get large scalability. You can put multiple strong boxes together. So you can get big numbers out of, out of the way you look at a strong box architecture. And of course, the way that we talked about multi-copies, they could create multi-copies of the tape. And uh, more importantly was the reliability of that, is that they knew what they wrote on there had at least a two order of magnitude reliability greater than this. Now that, that's the difference of having, um, uh, if you look at you know, bit error rate, um, in that example, that t typically you might see disk in the calculation on a petabyte that it would have a bit error rate that would be about once every 15 days. And the difference when we talk about the tape, you're talking about once every, I think it's 15 years. You know, don't hold me the exact, exact numbers, but you got the general idea on the difference on order of magnitude. So you're talking about for them the ability to keep that data protected and secure because they never know when they're going to want that information in the future. And that was, that was critical to the way they thought about securing their archive. So at the end of the day, why Strongbox? Integrated automated data protection that's right there without having to back up their data. Um, less expensive, it worked easily out of the box, um, scalable, and allowed them to meet their mission objective. So these were really, really important parts of it. And the last thing, most importantly, is all their data was online all the time, right? None of this was uh, offline and unavailable, unaccessible. Their users could get their data when they needed it. So let's just the next slide. Let's kind of just overview. This is, we're going to show three, three quick use cases um, around how, how Strongbox can work uh, in, a, in an HPC environment. 
The first one fits right to what we just ex I just shared around Jet Propulsion Labs, which is the um, long-term preservation architecture. And this just gives a kind of a diagram outline of how did they architect it. The, you have a strong box that sits on the network, so 10 gig or gig E connectivity. You're writing your files in. The library and the, and the disk cache uh, can attach on the back SAS or fiber, and then the replication um, to a second site or multiple sites. So this is exactly in the JPL architecture. The next use case is leveraging the cache technology to where it can replace disk. This is a, still a complement to your high performance tiers, but instead of having to have multiple tiers, that you could leverage more out of the way the disk cache can operate and the policies to where you can uh, have a single environment that has automated data protection with disk performance. So what we're showing here is an example where we have different data sets coming in for different years. So let's say we're collecting current data today, and we have last year's data and the year before that, and each one of those can be set up in different shares. Each share can have a different set of policies around it, and those provide an ability to have different performances to the user. So this year's data be to be a uh, active, uh, active to the user, you might want it very disk-like. So we might have a little bit more of the file or all of the file in the cache so the user's experience is just like if it was coming off a disk. But the older data, when we go back 5 or 10 or 30 years, you might have that as a, a not quite the same performance level because the access rate of the data isn't quite as relevant. And so, or excuse me, at least from a performance point of view, is, isn't quite as, as critical. And so what we might have is less of that data where it's more economical. So we can create multiple shares with different policies to the user to where you can control that performance and speed. And this way the user can uh, leverage the strong box as a tier two like performance with tier three economics. Again, nothing changes the fact that files are in the tape. All we're changing is how we leverage the disk cache. And the strong box and the way that it operates is just using volume disk here or sand disk. It just attached, and there is no, no real cost besides the raw cost of disk. And disk, in this case, can be very cheap. So this is a very good way to manage performance flexibility to scalability uh, by just adding an additional disk into the environment. So this becomes very, very cost effective as we look at different users, different performances, or different policies going up and down. Now, this can also mean if we used um, in something like in genomics, we're creating data sets their data comes back in and we're doing an experiment and maybe we're doing some initial reviews on the data where in the next 30 days we know we're going to look at that data set and then it goes cold. We can set policies up to behave in that way as well to where new data stays up in the cache for certain periods of time or based on file type and then it tear off the disk cache and then when it's used again it'll come back into the cache. So there's a lot of different policies that we can discuss further about how does it operate. So let's go to the next slide. Who are, some of the, who are some of the users? We have a broad base of users around HPC, everything from medical, as I mentioned, to uh, government. Um, and these have different, different ways that they look at their workflow and their performance. So you can see you have a very flexible system that can be tuned to dislike performance or to very inexpensive leverage the economics of tape. And it's like a big dial. The user gets to turn that based on what they're trying to achieve and where they're trying to go. So hopefully the, the strong box, I've been able to outline that you can look at something that can plug easily into your environment, easy to manage and use, and then be able to meet your long-term retention and data protection with integrated uh, policy management to get you a cost-effective solution for protecting your high-performance data. Well, great, Dave. I mean, uh, you know, thanks for putting this in an HPC perspective. Uh, do these varying clients you have, do they have different performance requirements, and, and, and how do you step up to that? Well, it's really, we do. They, they, I think every customer has a little bit different. <clears throat> what we're looking at, the way, the, way the, the, the performance can be tuned is the flexibility of adding additional cash. So there's no limit about how much cash I can in, add to the environment. It's really what disk vendor did you pick, and what does their controller allow? So you could actually have a one-to-one -one ratio where we have environments where we want everything to have very high performance, but we want it automatically protected. So we can have something that looks like a disk to disk with automatic tape by the fact that I write a file in the strong box, it's, everything stays in the cache, everything's on the tape, and that's going to have the performance of that disk. So when I click open file, it's going to come off at whatever the speed of that disk that you added. And that could even be SSD. So you could have flash in there 
that you're going to get you know very very high performance to it and everything's automatically protected by the fact that it's in the in the tape component of the strong box as well so there's the extreme on one side now on the other side where we have some government data and we're collecting um you know like we'll just call it weather data where we're keeping just lots and lots of information uh from all over you know we really aren't going to go back and once we've generated the metadata we're probably never going to go back and look at the actual file data again unless there's you know something you have to rebuild in this case we want the other extreme right we want to get to the lowest cost so we want to use the smallest amount of disk cache possible you could even take the disk cache to zero if you wanted but then again you don't have quite as seamless of the performance because you're going to have a latency waiting for tape load so we want to go to the minimum configuration of the minimum cache to the disk configuration. So in a in a 10 petabyte environment, you you, know, you still might have a very small cache. In that petabyte example I gave um, earlier, we were looking at only eight terabytes of disk to a petabyte of native capacity. So you can see the economics are very powerful, and the user experience is somewhat seamless. It would look like if you were pulling a file off the internet pretty much right i click open the file load is coming and what i'm waiting for is i'm waiting for the network and etc for the file to get there that would kind of be the be the behavior of a system where it's very highly tuned to the economics so it's still available it's still accessible but we're kind of controlling it based on how we architect it and it's really about the sla when's the time to last byte so if we added ssd or fiber in our architectures we know what we're paying for is performance Let's add Strongbox to that mix. In all three of those, I click open file. It's always instant. It's just how fast is the, the complete file come to me. SSD is going to be faster than fiber channel disk, and fiber channel disk is going to be faster than Strongbox. So that's kind of how you get to balance it is what disk configurations do you want to put in the Strongbox to control your speed. Well, great, Dave. You know, we're running short on time, but uh, are you guys going to be at uh, SC13 in Denver? Um, we will. We'll be in uh, our partner booth, which is a company called Bion. So we'll be there. And then uh, we also partner with, uh, with HDS. So um, please look us up and happy to talk to anybody uh, in more detail. Terrific. Well, hey, I want to thank you once again for uh, telling us about this and coming on the show today. Thanks for including me. I appreciate it. And uh, always, always happy to help. Well, you bet. Okay, folks, that's it for the Rich Report. Stay tuned for more news and information on high-performance computing.